So this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this idea that we found out in, in Toy Story. And if you are new here for the first time and you don't know what the heck is happening, um, it's our winter holiday series. So I would like to take familiar movies, take out values out of them, and then apply them to biblical stories to see that what we can learn from them. Now, for those of you who've been watching Toy Story, there's about four, about four of them. It's really a, a very dark story. Few people pick up on this. But basically, you've got this Woody toy who was the favorite, and a new toy boy pops up on the scene, which is Buzz Lightyear, a cool guy, big muscles, he's got this awesome suit on, and then this tension about who's the favorite toy to play with. And if you pick up on the movie, there's quite a lot of darkness between the characters. I don't know if you guys picked it up. Um, even though it's a, it's a kid's movie, um, I was astounded by how aggressive they were. I'm thinking, if you, if you want to teach your kids some good values, and they watch Toy Story and they see a lot of fighting and happening. You know, it's a little bit, a little bit dark. Any case, the point being is, um, there's a couple of points that stands out for me in this movie, and I want to draw it through to a biblical story, and then I want to um, speak a little bit about that in our practical life. Um, the f- maybe I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with the scripture first. Maybe that's a that's a good idea. Um, can, can you guys just quickly skip the scripture verse quickly for me? I just want to take out a couple of points which I want to take out before I go back to the scripture. The first thing that I want you to stand out, out of this idea of toy stories, that relationships are complex. Relationships are complex or complicated. It, it's, it's, it's difficult. This, this phenomenal guy, Ian Cron, he wrote this book, The Road Back to You. He talks about personalities and he gives us example of um, like two little hedgehogs, I've explained it before. It's like, imagine it's winter and people are like hedgehogs. The only way to survive the winter is if we are close together, okay? But the problem is the closer together we are, the more spikes we put into one another. But you can't survive without the other spikes. So it's this, this, this love and hate type of relationship of needing to be close, but it's hurtful at the same time because when you love, love hurts. Love hurts. And out of this movie comes this idea that relationships are extremely complex. And what I, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm explaining this to you is because I want you to draw this through to our relationship with God. Okay? Sorry, I spring no my 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 quick is no um biggie rondi. So but I want you to pick up on this theme that when it happens in a movie where relationships are complex, it's fine for us. But the moment it happens in our walk with God, we feel confused about things. We feel confused about God. We feel confused about our faith. And this morning, I'm going to speak a little bit about this relationships being complex, things not working out as we plan them, and how that relates to our walk with God. But come as lees the Bible before I my voorspring. So, you can now from above begin with my PowerPoint. We're going to talk about a, um, out of a character, um, Jeremiah, out of the Bible. We're going to read just quickly um, a couple of 10 verses. And if you guys can follow, um, you'll look on from I want to pre-warn you, the Bible names was very unpopular names. And I have no idea how to pronounce half of them. Okay, so before you judge me, you try to say it seven times fast. Okay, <laughs> the words of Jeremiah, that's the easy name. Okay, the son of Hilkiah. One of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, I think he was Chinese, but I'm not sure. The son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now, I get it. That's a lot of boring information. I want you to pick on something. The author is not writing a fictional story. The author is giving exact dates with exact names to make sure that you can fact check him. Okay? So I want you to grab hold of one thing before we even start. It's not a fictional story. It's not a made-up story. This is a journalist looking into the life of Jeremiah and is giving points of reference so that we can check that up. My biggest frustration sometimes in the modern church is people in the church and out the, outside the church, we, we hold this book as a fantasy story. 
We link it up with the Lord of the Rings and the fairy tales and Shrek and all those fantastic movies. But the point is that this is not a fictional story. And there's a reason why all these what we refer to boring things are put in. It's not to bore you to death. It's to build your faith to say this is legit that took place. Okay. Now, verse 4 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I, listen to this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I want, I want you to highlight this. I want you to put this down. I want you to um, um, take note of this because the text is contradicting. Okay, The reason why I'm saying it's contradicting because God calls Jeremiah and says there's something special about Jeremiah, but his life on earth was miserable. The start of the book says God is calling you, but the content of the book is a guy who loathes living. It seems like the Bible is contradicting itself. It seems like the Bible is a little bit confused because it starts off with God, but it ends off also with God, but messed up. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about. Relationships are complicated and things don't always work out as we plan them. And I'm glad you're asking these good questions today because we're going to talk about them. Verse 6, then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, pick up. Jeremiah is hesitant to respond to the call of God. And God convinces him to follow up on the call. And when he does that, all hell breaks loose. He doesn't get, become famous in his town. He doesn't become wealthy. He doesn't have his health. He doesn't even get a wife. He gets nothing. He gets problems, he gets persecution, he gets insults, and Jeremiah is conflicted because God calls him to do something, and then God leaves him to be beaten up by people. It doesn't make sense. Relationships are complicated, and things don't always work out the way we plan them. And God says to Jeremiah, do not say I am only a youth. For to, all to whom, uh, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Now for us, yeah, whatever God commands us, we shall speak. Yeah, it's scary, because we don't always want to hear what God's saying to us. We live in a time in church where when the news is bad, we believe it's not from God. So God can't warn us. He can't discipline us. He can't put us on the process of sanctification because the moment the word discipline comes from a prophet's mouth, we disregard it as, no, it can't be from God because God is love. And it's scary what God is saying here. And then God says immediately afterwards, so do not be afraid of them. Okay, he says, I'm going to tell you what you are going to say and you're going to speak my words. And he, God puts a disclaimer in. Uh, do not be afraid of them. He knows something bad is going to happen. For I am with you. And to deliver you, declares, I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you, but later on in the text, where Jeremiah is so frustrated with God, I'm jumping my notes all over the place, where he calls God a deceiver. It's going to get bad this morning. I know. It's, you're going to read things in this Bible that you won't believe stands in this Bible. Okay. Verse 9, then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. S to have God's word in your mouth is the biggest responsibility you can have. Because sometimes you are called to say things that's not popular. Sometimes a dad needs to discipline his children. Sometimes a wife needs to discipline her husband. Sometimes the words of God in our mouth is words of discipline and holding people accountable. And that's not nice. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms. To pluck up and to break down and to destroy and to overflow, uh, to overthrow, to build 
and to plant. Beautiful verses that God speaks. But confusing when you actually read the book. When you read the book, we pick up on these contradicting statements and this complex idea. Jylle kan dier het volgende slide gaan. Write this down. Relationships are complex. Do you guys have that by now? Are you sure? Okay. We said, uh, moet, Andri, excuse, moet maar dier my PowerPoint hard op daas vir my. We said that it's fine when things happen like this in a movie, it's entertaining. But the hassle comes in when we, it happens in our lives where relationship becomes complex. Jy kan maar aanskyf, hoor. Oh, sorry. Nee, die volgende ene. The reason why it becomes confusing in our lives, because our life gets out of hand inside the church. We sit inside the church, we follow Yahweh, and our life gets out of hands because relationships aren't working, friendships are working out, aren't working out. We're filled with doubt when it comes to God. And when we watch a movie like Toy Story, it's fun to watch it there. But now it's complicated because the Bible says these phenomenal things about God. The Bible says these beautiful things about God has called me. God loves me. God pursues the one lost sheep and leaves the 99 behind. God is this amazing being and we have this contradicting experience because I'm ill, because I'm not feeling well, because things aren't working out, because my life isn't sorted, because I can't get the job that I've got, because I've got financial issues, and we've got this whole contradicting experience. But is it possible, is it possible for us to be confused because we've got homemade expectations? Soek vir die slide, dan kan jy vir my net opsit, asjeblief. Homemade expectations about God. Where we put a expectation on God that He did not say He will do. And we hold Him, we hold him accountable to a promise that He did not make to us. Because we serve a misguided religion. In church, we are faced with a situation where, and I'm going to quote Andy Stanley on this, where the version of Christianity that we follow is not the same that you find in the Bible that we are reading. I have met people that follows the faith when it comes to Christianity, but they've got zero relationship with the Word of God. I have followed people that read things in the Bible and they discredit what takes place in the Word because it doesn't agree with their world view. We follow our own version of Christianity. We aren't following God. And that is very complicated because we misquote Scripture verses to fit our situation. We, and you will hear me say this quite a lot as well. We weaponize the Bible and says, because I can take this scripture in the word, I can use it the way I want to, even when I'm out there hurting other people. It's fine because I'm using this scripture verse as, as a reference. We are following our own version of the Christian faith. And sometimes we sit in church and we get disappointed with God. We get disappointed with our walk with God, not because of God's side, but because of homemade expectations that we apply. In, our lives. in order to draw a conclusion and draw from this text, there's a couple of main points that I want to hold out to you. And the first thing that I want to talk about quickly as we look at these ideas is, I want to give you a background of the book of Jeremiah just for one second, just for one second. Why this book is so phenomenal, Jeremiah is a, is a major prophet. I want just to give you a little bit, a bit of a picture. We have the Assyrian invasion about 700 years before Jesus rocks up on the scene, okay? There's two main invasions in the Old Testament. We have the Assyrian invasion and we've got the Babylonian invasion. Now, why am I sharing this boring historical view? Because I need you to understand the time zone that's taken place. As the, the, the book of Jeremiah is being written, we notice this time period where the nation of Israel is just recovering from a devastating invasion in their, in their land. 
And when I say invasion, guys, I'm not talking about where there's some text that's made higher. I'm talking about children lost their lives. People were starving to death. Their God seems powerless. Yahweh is nowhere to be found because the enemy's gods have been conquering their nation. This is how they see things back then. Because it wasn't just Israel who was defeated. It seemed like Yahweh was defeated. Because if Yahweh is powerful, how on earth did the Assyrians defeat them? So they're coming just out of this, in this recovery period. And when we rock up on Jeremiah, just a couple of years, about a hundred years later, we notice this second invasion of the Babylonians. So the whole book of Jeremiah is written in this power shift that's taking place between Assyria and eventually in a, about a hundred years later the Babylonian empire was established and Israel and Yahweh is just a little dot to us it's nothing but the Israelites heard of the stories of David they read about the stories of Solomon where God was enthroned, where the nation was powerful, where they were dominating the entire area, where the Bible says that in Solomon's time, silver was so common as stones in the road. They were wealthy and established, and now they're deteriorating to a place where they are being dominated by other nations and other gods. It's difficult to defend your God when you are defeated. And they're in this very intense Power struggle that's taking place. You can on the PowerPoint. This power shift that's taking place. And in the middle of this book of Jeremiah, we see the end of the nation of Israel taking place. The end of the nations selected, the nation selected by God. Tension, pain, and God comes and we open the book and says, I have called you, Jeremiah. And I'm going to put my words into your mouth. But all hell is going to break. Okay, God didn't say all hell is breaking loose, but I'm going to tell you all hell is breaking loose. In this context of this, this transition of power, there's, there's a couple of, and I'm, I'm calling this my, my scary truths that pop up in the Bible. You can move me opposite. The point being in this book, as we're looking at this, is that association with Yahweh is not enough. I'm going to explain this in a second. Fascination is not the same as following. The scary truth about Jeremiah, listen to this that I'm trying to, the scary truth about the book of Jeremiah is this. Just because you're standing next to the temple, it doesn't mean you are protected by your, from your enemies. It's difficult to understand Jeremiah because the people are calling out to God. They have the temple. They are associated with Yahweh, the God, the creator. They've been writing songs about him and they find themselves in a situation where because the covenant is broken, not even the temple, standing next to the temple will keep you safe. Association with God is not enough. Fascination with God is not enough. If we don't follow God we aren't connected to God you can like God you can admire Jesus you can read your Bible but if you don't follow and this is the scary part of the Jeremiah saying that even though you can be children of Abraham you can born be born into the right family you can live in the in the town where the temple is if you do not follow God if you do not turn towards God, there's no relationship. And the book of Jeremiah is simply this. Judgment is coming. It's scary. It's not nice. It doesn't make us feel comfortable. But I want you to pick up on something. You have to follow God. You can't just like Him. You have to follow Jeremiah, again, being called as this beautiful prophet, everything is starting off beautiful. And as you can quote me on this, again, all hell is about to break loose. And remember, Jeremiah wasn't the only prophet. We find Jeremiah speaking the words of God in this book. 
All the other prophets, they're speaking peace with their words. Remember, guys following Yahweh or they are connected to Yahweh. They are worshiping in the temple. And everyone is saying peace, peace, peace. And Jeremiah stands up and says, I don't know what you are talking about, but God has revealed to me that war is coming and there's nothing we can do about it because we have broken the covenant. We have broken the covenant. It looks on the outside like we are doing the right things. And I'm going to show you some scriptures where he says that. But the hearts have been turned away from God. How many people sit in church that they show the right actions on the outside, but the inside is not okay? The inside is not okay. We aren't even convinced about the book that we read. We don't even read the book that we tell other people to read about. And it's scary, and, it's, and I, I, know, I know it sounds a little bit, bit heavy, but I want you to pick up on something. Relationships are complicated, and things don't work um, according to what we plan things. And I'm going to rush because I've only got a couple of minutes left. The, the background of Jere- Jeremiah, I want to quickly speak about this. Khan for me now, Jeremiah 1 verse 1 to 3. The words of Jeremiah, so we quickly spoke about the background of the book and this tension that's taking place. And now, Jeremiah, I want you to just to show you this beautiful start, and I'm going to get to to my, my main points in a second. His father was a priest. Jeremiah was raised in the right family, a family that was God-fearing. His start was good. His start was beautiful. He was raised in the house of a priest, and he was trained in this. And then not only trained, God calls him specifically by name. What a beautiful way to start off your ministry. If you look at what his name means, it means Yahweh has raised up. I mean, there's no more Christian churchy name than that. Okay, not Christian, more Jewish, but you guys pick up on what I'm trying to say. He's got the right family. He's got the right name. He's connected in the right way. And yet, guess even better, before all hell breaks loose, look, check it, verse 2. We've read that. It says, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Now, just to pick up on this, Jeremiah's father was a priest. He's got this beautiful name. And when he steps into prophetic power, if I can use that term, the king who is appointed is also a very special King, I want to show you this quickly. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And not only did he start when he was young, he reigned 30. He reigned 30. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. That is a long time. His father reigned two years. So we are, and why why did it rain so for, for um, s- such a long time? No, can you? Shush. Because he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of David. That wasn't his father, but just to illustrate his conviction towards Yahweh, the author illustrates him and says his great grandfather, David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or the left. So Jeremiah pops on on the scene. When the king who is ruling is restoring the worship, but yet there's judgment on, on the way. Yet we see a lot of messy things happen. Look how bad things were. If we just, I'm just keep skipping a couple of verses here. And Hilkiah, remember Jeremiah's dad, the high priest said to Stephen, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. In other words, the book was lost. Inside the temple for years, the nation of Israel did not open their book of the law. In other words, in our terms, they were going to church, but they did not open their Bible once. The Bible, there was only one book. The Bible was, uh, not the Bible, but the law was so lost and so forgotten, they misplaced it in one building and they couldn't find it. And Jeremiah's dad found the book. And now we see this King Josiah um, getting this book. And he's concerned about this book because we have turned as a nation our hearts against God. There's no better perfect way for a prophet to step up into the scene when the authority is restoring the worship that's taking place. And Josiah says the following in verse 12, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the father of, of Jeremiah, the priest, and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and, and saying the following, 
Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us. Because what? Our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. Now, that's devastating. But there's no better scene for this called prophet to stand up. Everything is perfect. Everything is smooth. But yet we come to a point where we find the prophet being named the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. How on earth can your start be so good, but you are known for complaining and weeping? What happened? I want you to pick up on this as well. The stop is beautiful. But the Babylonians, they are at the doorsteps of the nation of Israel to completely destroy them. And Jeremiah, if I fast forward just a couple of, of, of stories just to not keep you um, busy unnecessarily, we find him speaking the words of God to his people and their own people, his own people he's speaking to, persecute him. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the God, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. This perfect start. We start the book off perfectly. And we come to the end where they drop him down in a pit and they leave him to die. They leave the prophet of God to die. And Jeremiah is nothing. He's sinking into the mud. There's no hope. And he's doing everything God has told him to do. He's obeying God and he's ending up in hell. He's obeying God and he's being persecuted and rejected by his own people. He was called, he was raised, he's got the special king when he started off and now we find him devastated in his life. How did things turn out this way? Simply because he did what God told him to do. You can follow God and your circumstances can still be messed up. You can follow God and be obedient to God and your circumstances might not change. This is a little bit contradicting to the message that we sometimes find in churches. And remember when I said we've got this homemade expectations that we put on to God. Take it, Jeremiah 38 verse 2. Thus says the Lord, Jeremiah speaking. He who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war, and he will live. And thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. And because he was speaking the words of God, the king throws him in a pit. Because the words of God is breaking down the, mor um, the, the morals of the, the army is standing on the walls. The Babylonians is attacking and the king is trying to defend the nation of Israel. This was a, a bit later, King Josiah passed away and so I'm not going to talk about that now. But the point being is, and the prophet of God is telling the people around him to give up. God is telling you to give up. And the king doesn't want to hear that. And they persecute him because he's following God. And this is where I want to build. I know this, I know this has been a long build up, but I need you to understand this to understand the next section. I want to show you the complaints of Jeremiah. And then I'm going to give you three points and then be going home. He starts off and he says, righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Okay. Yet. So he says, God, you are righteous, but there's something... Yet I would plead my case before you. He says, God is righteous, but how on earth is the wicked prospering? I know God is fair. I know God is righteous, but the wicked is prospering. And then he says, why do all the treacherous thrive? I am doing what you have called me to do, and I hate my life. He complains even further. And he says, you plant them. He says, God, you are planting the unrighteousness. You are the guy who establishes them. And they take root and they grow and they produce fruit. You are near, listen, in their mouth, 
but Lord, I can see that you are not in their hearts. Jeremiah is accusing God and saying, these people are fake. But yet you bless them and you establish them. And I'm speaking your words and they throw me in a pit to die. I don't have food. I'm starving to death. But you, oh Lord, you know me. You see me and you test my heart towards you. In other words, he's saying, I am doing everything right and nothing is working out in my life. Nothing. Pull them out like sheep. <laughs> He's asking God to kill them. Just take them out. Just, just finish it so I can be done. Yes, it's a, it's a prayer in the Bible, okay? And set them apart for the day of slaughter. He carries on. It's going to get much worse before it's going to get better. And how long will you land? Will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beast and the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. Why is my pain unceasing? I've been praying to God, but my pain is not stopping. I've been offering my life to God. But the pain is not going away. Jeremiah says, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed. And listen to this most arrogant statement Jeremiah speaks. Remember this guy called, this guy in the special start, and this war taking place, and all these nasty things slowly progressing. And Jeremiah comes to, to a point where he says, will you be to me like a deceitful brook? He's calling God deceitful. A guy following God, accusing God of being deceitful. I, 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 I get frustrated in my life. But speaking to God and, and, and linking God up to a deceitful brook. And he knows what he did now because he's trying to fix this. So he says the following. Oh Lord, <laughs> you have, and now he's going to accuse God of something. You have been so cool and awesome. You have given me lots of money and a wonderful mother-in-law. He wrote this. He, he wrote that in the Bible. <laughs> it's just he messes. No, no, he doesn't write this. He writes, he says, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. And now he accuses God of bullying. He says, you are stronger than I. And you have prevailed, and I've become a laughing stock to all the, all the day. Everyone mocks me. Almost finished. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. In other words, what he's saying, every time I open my mouth, I'm speaking what you have put in my mouth. Every time I am represented in front of people where I'm representing you, I don't speak the good news that I want to speak. I speak the true words that you want to speak. And he says, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. Just to explain what this means quickly, and I'm coming to the end. Reproach, the expression of disapproval or disappointment. God's word is becoming a disappointment to Jeremiah. The weeping prophet with his beautiful son, derision, means contemptuous, ridicule, or mockery. God's word has become a mockery to him. But he adds, <laughs> if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, <laughs> there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. Pause here quickly. We like to quote Jeremiah, you know, don't worry about being young and I have called you and I know the plans that I've got for you. It's all these beautiful scriptures where, where it's beautiful saying God knows your journey. He's there with you. But all hell breaks loose on this journey. But Jeremiah in this hell gets him to a point where he still can't turn his back on God. He does not like the journey, but he still walks the journey. He doesn't like the process, but he still goes through the process because there's this fire that shut up in my bones and I'm weary with holding it in. I cannot, I cannot reject your name. I cannot keep quiet because you have anointed me. 
God's anointing isn't manskyn in rosa. Following Yahweh is not a smooth road forward. Stop having homemade expectations on this. We see a man speaking of responsibility. He says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. This guy's bipolar because just check what he says next. He says, cursed be the day on which I was born. I don't know what's, ha- I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you. <laughs> the guy's cursed who told him the news. By the way, just for, for interesting sake, now that I'm, I'm referring to bipolar, it's, it's actually phenomenal, phenomenal to see the, the mental health of the people who's been following God. If we think, you know, mental health is just a modern thing, we see people struggling in the Bible with depression. They're struggling with these elements of inadequacy and doubt. They struggle, they, they struggle with the same emotions that we are struggling with. I want you to pick up on a guy who's broken, a guy who's mixed between one moment loving God and the next moment cursing his, the day he was born, a guy who's torn on the inside, being broken, still following Yahweh. Still following Him. I want us to conclude, and I want to take out three main points, and then this last thing that I want to share, and this is why I've been telling this entire story with you. You can't plan God. You cannot plan God. I, I want you to take, to take this out quickly out of the story. God is God. You cannot manipulate Him. You cannot twist His arm. You cannot, you cannot hear what is. There's no such thing. God is God. The same water that is used to sustain our life was the same water that God used to wipe out the world. The same words that He used to say, I love you, is the same words that created the world. It's words of power. It's words of authority. God is God and you are arrogant if you think you can plan Him. And you're even more arrogant if you think you can manipulate him. The second thing is, and I want you to pick up on this in the story of um, Jeremiah as we are finishing. It's not about winning. It was about obeying. In Jeremiah's life, he did not win. He complained. In my opinion, he was just plain rude to God as well. He complained, he argued, he did not win. It's not about right and wrong, it's about lost and found. You can be broken. You can be hurting. Your circumstances can be in a mess. But the kingdom of God is not a kingdom that can be linked to any kingdom in this world. If you link your life to a political party, and I'm not talking about voting, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the process of winning, getting on top, beating competitors. If you link your life up with that and think the kingdom of God is like this political area where you rise up in the ranks and you get sorted. It doesn't work like that. God's kingdom does not exist in a form or factor that we find in this world. It's out of this world. It's God's kingdom and it works differently. In God's kingdom, don't pray for winning. You need to pray for obedience. You need to pray that the lost become found. Number three, in the story of Jeremiah, the world is not perfect. Toy Story, messed up. Relationships are mixed. Things aren't going according to plan. Even God's plan is not always going according to plan. When God came to the earth, he did not fix the earth. He established Eden. God did not get a perfect world. God did not, cre- God did not come and everything was in order. You know how God created. When God created order, he created boundaries. He created rules. Order came into being when God came down and he says, the sea will only go up until this point. Order came when God says, light will split from darkness. When God created order, he created boundaries in life. There is no such thing as a perfect world. If God did not get a perfect world, it's a bit arrogant to think that we will get a perfect world. 
It's not about perfection. Get the news, absorb it. Is not my net in for nothing again. Your life is not going to be perfect. Things are going to be messed up. Things are going to be broken. It's not going to be perfect. But here's the beautiful thing about this journey about God is that God still chose us. Even though he knows it's not going to be a perfect world. Even though he knows it's not going to be a perfect journey. That's why he sent Jesus. Because he didn't want to wipe us out. He sent Jesus to fix the broken relationship. God is sticking with his plan. The world is not perfect. Your life is not perfect. And this is the point that I'm trying to make. Your circumstances is not a reflection of the level of love that God has for you. I know, it's been a long build up to this one sentence. I, I get it. But if I didn't explain it this way, you're not going to get the big picture. God loves Jeremiah. God called Jeremiah. And his whole world fell apart. I want to speak to just a couple of people here this morning. And say, stop beating yourself up. Because you're evaluating God's love for you with your bank statement. You're evaluating God's love for you with the report that you get from the doctor. You're evaluating God's love for you based on the journey that you are walking. If this is true, God did not love his own son. If that is true, God did not love Paul. And God did not love Peter. If this is true, God does not love man. Because the world is a mess. Stop linking up your circumstances. With your love, that, the love that God has for you. You have to make peace with it. Things will go wrong in this world. But it's not that God doesn't love you. God has called you and things won't go smooth. You can all speak to any pastor in the world. <laughs> God has called you and things are still messed up in your, in your life. You can come to church every single Sunday. Things are still messed up in your life. Guess what? You can worship God and you will still die one day. Okay, I, that's a guarantee. You can write it down. They must print it in chappy papers as well. Okay, Things will happen in your life, but it's not a reflection that things are wrong with you. Stop beating yourself up. Stop feeling rejected. Stop hurting yourself. I'm here to tell you that God can love you even though you find yourself in a pit. God can love you even though things are messed up in your life. God's love is not dependent on your circumstances. Stop breaking yourself down. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. There's so many times in our lives where we, we abuse ourselves mentally on the inside. God doesn't love me because look at this. God doesn't love me because look at this. Things are going to happen in this world. Things happen to Jeremiah. But the bottom line is, it's not about winning. It's about being obedient. And it's about being found in God. And when we can do that, our circumstances are irrelevant in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we say thank you for your word that carries power and authority, Father. My prayer this morning is, Father, that you would use this word so that it can build and produce fruit in our lives, Father. Father, sometimes in life we've got these high expectations. We've got this fantasy idea of you, Father. We are in this world, but we live as if the world is not relevant to our lives, Father. But, Father... We say that we commit our hearts to you, Father. We ask that you would protect our hearts so that we do not link up our surroundings and our circumstances with our relationship with you. Your word teaches that you are faithful. Your word teaches us that you are a good Father. And we hold on to that truth. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says, Amen. Amen.